welcome back to Davenant Academy. I'm Dr. Brad Littlejohn, and this is our class, Introduction to the Reformation. Today, we're going to be talking about John Calvin and Martin Bootser. Up until now, we've talked about first the background of the Reformation, then the early Lutheran stages of the Reformation, the work of Martin Luther and his associates, Philip Melanchthon, and so on. Then the beginnings of the Reformation in Switzerland, specifically in Zurich under Ulrich Zwingli, and then also uh, Oiko Lampadius in Basel. And from there, after talking a little bit about the conflicts that emerged, began to emerge between the uh, Luther and the Swiss reformers, we moved over the, across the English Channel and talked about the beginnings of the English Reformation. Now we're gonna move back to the continent and introduce a character that most of you probably are at least fairly familiar with. At least, this is at least one name that you are pretty certain to know. John Calvin. Now, John Calvin is a Frenchman. His name is actually Jean, Jean Calvin, if you wanted to say it correctly. Well, or close to correctly. I'm sure a Frenchman would actually correct me on that. So Calvin is a little bit, uh, a little bit late to the party, as far as the Reformation goes. He's, he's what's often considered a second generation reformer. He begins his reforming work. Um, he first sort of makes a name for himself almost 20 years after Luther had first posted the 95 Theses. But he's going to become very important as the Reformation goes on, as uh, he is associated with the emergence of what comes to be called Calvinism or the Reformed tradition, which is increasingly, again, not obvious at the beginning, but as time goes on, takes shape as a somewhat distinct form of Protestantism from that which, um, which, we saw, uh, which we see among the followers of Martin Luther. Now, Calvin begins to encounter the Reformation when he is a law student at the University of Orléans and then also at the University of Bourges in the later 1520s and early 1530s. There, he comes in contact with a number of humanist thinkers. You may recall that humanism is this important movement that's, that's a kind of a predecessor to the Reformation. And humanism is interested in going back to the sources, back to the original texts of scripture and the church fathers. And the humanists are also very keen on moral reform and concerned about the corruptions of the clergy in the later medieval church. Many of the reformers had begun life as, uh, as humanists, like, uh, like Ulrich Zwingli in Zurich. So Calvin comes in contact with these humanists in, uh, during his, his studies and also begins to read some of the writings of Luther. And he himself and begin, and he begins to read the scriptures and he experiences an evangelical conversion. And here's what he says about his own conversion. Being exceedingly alarmed at the misery into which I had fallen, and much more at that which threatened me in view of eternal death, I, duty-bound, made it my first business to betake myself to your way, condemning my past life, not without groans and tears. And now, O oh Lord, what remains to a wretch like me, but instead of defense, earnestly to supplicate you not to judge that fearful abandonment of your word according to its deserts, from which in your wondrous goodness you have at last delivered me. So this is probably sometime around 1533 or 1534. This is after the Augsburg Confession has been written and presented to um, Charles V in Germany. It's after the Marburg Colloquy dispute between Luther and Zwingli. It's after the English Reformation has gotten rolling. So, um, hang on a second. So Calvin uh, makes a name for himself very quickly with the publication of this treatise, the Christiani Religionis Institutio, da, 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 which we know, of course, as the Institutes of the Christian Religion. The full title here in Latin reads, the Institutes of the Christian Religion, uh, in which uh, containing uh, the whole sum of piety in general, and whatever must be known, whatever is necessary to be known for the doctrine of salvation 
uh, a work most necessary to be read by all who are desirous of piety and recently edited. Okay, and one here, Praefatio ad Christianissimum Regum Franciae, with a preface to the most Christian king of France. All right, to whom this book is offered for a confession of faith. Now, the most Christian king of France is, of course, Francois I, Francis I, a character that we introduced back in lesson four, talking about the political context of the Reformation. So Francis is a very uh, ambitious and forceful monarch, like his rival in England, uh, Henry VIII, and, and uh, the, his rival in the Holy Roman Empire, Charles V. And Francis I is very committed to protecting the old Catholic religion, in particular because he doesn't have that much to lose by conflicts with the Pope, because in 1516 he had negotiated a deal with the Pope in which the French church had a lot, the, the French king had a lot of control over the French church. So you don't have the same kind of issue as in England where there's a strong rivalry between king and pope. In France, the Catholic church largely serves the interests of the monarchy and so the monarch serves the interests of the Catholic church. Now Francis is very suspicious of Protestants and there are not a huge number, but there's a growing number of people throughout France who are beginning to embrace the Protestant faith and, um, and it, it influenced by both, by both Luther and by Zwingli and the Swiss reformers. And a couple years earlier, there had been an event called the Affair of the Placards in which uh, a, a French Protestant leader known as a Huguenot, this is, let me give you this word here. Um, so Huguenot, I don't know why it's in blue. Huguenot, this is the term used for French Protestants, and that's going to be the term going forward. So a Huguenot leader had posted placards, posted posters in various cities in France denouncing the mass, denouncing the evils of transubstantiation and the, and the, and the sacrificial theology of the Eucharist and calling it um, uh, idolatrous. And one of these placards was even posted on the door of the king's own bedchamber, which was quite alarming to him. It was, it was a clear breach of security. So the king and many others were quite outraged by these, these intemperate attacks on, as they saw, the most holy sacrament. So Francis does not look kindly on the Huguenots, and all the more so because in um, in Germany at this time, the Anabaptists have been making more and more of a name for themselves and not a good name. Uh, some of the Anabaptists had started out peacefully, started out as pacifists, but others became quite violent radicals and were willing to try to, uh, to, to sort of create their vision of the kingdom of God by force. And this led to a very kind of sensational incident in the city of Munster, which was taken over by um, so these violent Anabaptist radicals and ultimately led to a, a bloody siege and, and there were lots of crazy things that happened there that really kind of discredited, discredited the Anabaptist movement and also by extension discredited Protestants in general who were identified as being the source of these tumults and rebellions that were happening. So um, Calvin's goal in writing this Institute of the Christian Religion is first and foremost to persuade the King of France that Protestants aren't so scary after all. So let me share with you a few pages from Calvin's Institutes. And this again is taken from our book, Reformation Theology. So um, he says, uh, when I first engaged in this work, nothing was farther from my thoughts than to write Sorry. Nothing was farther from my thoughts than to write what should afterwards be presented to your majesty. My intention was only to furnish a kind of rudiment, rudiments by which those who feel some interest in religion might be trained to true godliness. And you see that in the title, right? This is, Calvin's goal was to write a kind of uh, a brief summary of Protestant teaching. This was a task that had been undertaken already by Luther's associate, Philip Melanchthon, remember? Melanchthon wrote the first kind of systematic summary but Calvin's going to improve on that. And generally the, the um, institutes was seen as 
when it first came out, the sort of best concise summary of Protestant teaching. And I toiled at the task, chiefly for the sake of my countrymen, the French, multitudes of whom I perceived to be hungering and thirsting after Christ. While very few seem to have been duly imbued with even a slender knowledge of them. That this was the object which I had in view is apparent from the work itself, which is written in a simple and elementary form adapted for instruction. And if some of you are, if any of you perhaps are familiar with the Institutes and are saying, well, that seemed to be my experience, the Institutes. Well, the original edition of the Institutes was far, far shorter than the, what we now know as the Institutes of the Christian religion. He, Calvin went on and expanded it throughout his life. So it really is a simple and elementary exposition of Protestant teaching in its original form. Uh, but he says, when I perceived that the fury of certain bad men had risen to such a height in your realm, there was no place in it for sound doctrine. I thought it might be of service if I were in the same work, both to give instruction to my countrymen and also to lay before your majesty a confession from which you may learn what this doctrine is that so inflames the rage of those madmen who are this day with fire and sword troubling your kingdom. And he goes on to address various um, uh, slanders that he thinks that have been brought against the Protestants by their opponents in France. And so, um, for instance, one of these, he says, is uh, that, that they are blamed for uh, seditions, for violence, and for, for rebellions. And he says um, that this is, this, is, this, is, this is ridiculous. That's not, uh, there, are, there have been, sure, violent outbreaks, but that is not our doing. That is not in obedience to Protestant teaching. He said, um, even in the days of the apostles, there were unlearned and unstable men who, as Peter tells us, wrested the inspired writings of Paul to their own destruction. Okay, so um, similarly, there are people who are going to take the, the, the very wholesome writings of Luther and twist them and distort them uh, and pervert, he says, pervert their spiritual freedom to carnal licentiousness. This is one of his concerns in writing the book, is that Luther's call of Christian freedom, which is a spiritual freedom, a freedom from the bondage of the conscience to the works of the law, this is being twisted to mean a freedom from all earthly authority. People are despising the authority of ministers in the church. They're despising the authority of rulers in, in both church and state. And that's where some of these um, wars and tumults are coming from. But that is not, he says, what the Protestants are about. So um, he says, be not moved, sire, by the absurd insinuations with which our adversaries are striving to frighten you into belief, into the belief that nothing else is wished for and aimed at but by this new gospel, or so they term it, an opportunity for sedition or an impunity for all kinds of vice. Right, this is another point, this idea that the Protestants were seeking impunity for all kinds of vice. That is, they were seeking to be able to basically sin and uh, sin that grace may abound. This was another condemnation of Protestant teaching. That uh, since Luther taught justification by faith alone and the free forgiveness of Christ, that the temptation was that uh, the believer would simply, uh, or not just the temptation, the idea, the accusation was that the idea was so that you could just keep on sinning and not have to worry about it, right? And so um, Calvin is saying this is a, a, a slander, a distortion, right? And he says, um, if any, that um, if any under pretext of the gospel excite tumults, if any use the liberty of the grace of God as a cloak for licentiousness, there are laws and legal punishments by which they may be punished up to the measure of their deserts. Only in the meantime, let not the gospel of God be evil spoken of because of the iniquities of evil men. So there may be people out there abusing this gospel, but punish, punish those people, but do not suppress the teaching of the, of the gospel. So um, Francois the first is, you know, this is the dedication that Calvin writes at the beginning of the Institutes and his hope is that the book will be persuasive to the king, whether the king read it at all or not, um, he's, he's not very moved by these arguments. And in fact, Francis becomes a pretty vicious persecutor of Protestants throughout the remainder of his reign in the next 10 years or so. And Protestants are going to have a very uh, difficult time in France throughout much of the 16th century, where they were pretty strongly opposed by the monarchy most of the time, or else by, um, and in some cases, just zealous Catholic mobs. In any case, though, um, Calvin, 
gains a great reputation for himself by writing this book. The book is circulated uh, all around Europe. It's written in Latin, which is the language that sort of that the learned throughout Europe can read. And so people in lots of different countries are reading the Institutes. And so Calvin is, even though he's, he's quite young at this point, he's only 27 years old, he is, is quite well known among other reformers. So he has to flee France because of the opposition he's receiving and he is, um, he goes to the city of Geneva, which is at the kind of border of France and Switzerland. Switzerland it's not Switzerland, it's not an independent country per se at this point, but it's, it's considered part of Switzerland. And um, Geneva had recently experienced the beginnings of Reformation and they had thrown out their Catholic leaders and the city council, this was what we saw in many places in Reformation and particularly in Switzerland, the city council would be taking the lead in organizing the Reformation. So the city council has been making some steps toward the Reformation and there's this fellow here, Guillaume Farrell, or William Farrell, who had been preaching uh, in Geneva and, and trying to really bring about a thoroughgoing Reformation there. Well, uh, Farrell knows that he is inadequate to this great task. And so when he sees Calvin, when he meets Calvin uh, traveling there, and uh, he knows of Calvin's reputation. He confronts Calvin and says, you have a mission. You are called by God to this work here. You, should, you need to be a minister here at the church in Geneva and, um, and be a leader in bringing this, this city to reformation. Calvin keeps holding out. He's like, oh, I'm never, I was never planning to be a minister. This is not my training. This is, I'm not worthy of this responsibility. And finally, Farrell famously um, sort of threatens Calvin, says, I declare in the name of God that if you do not assist us in this work of the Lord, the Lord will punish you for following your own interest rather than this call. So Calvin is very frightened and ultimately um, agrees to stay and help out in the church at Geneva. Now Calvin is only there, however, for just a couple of years before he provokes opposition. Uh, he and Pharaoh were both you know, fairly stubborn about their vision for how the reform should proceed. And the Genevan authorities were much more cautious. They were particularly concerned to maintain good relations with other Swiss cities that might be doing things differently, particularly the city of Bern, Switzerland, nearby, which had taken a more conservative approach to its reformation. So the Genevan authorities were moving rather slowly in certain matters and um, were not giving Farrell and Calvin the kind of leeway that they wanted to actually implement sweeping reforms. Ultimately, uh, there's a showdown, and uh, particularly, it's specifically over the question of whether to use unleavened bread in the Eucharist. This was commonly a, a dispute because the Catholic Church had, and had had the habit of using unleavened bread, these little wafers. You, you still see this in Catholic churches and in uh, Anglican churches, actually, the little wafers. Whereas many Protestant churches sought to reinstate the use of, of regular bread which they thought was less prone to superstition, perhaps. In any case, the Genevan city council was sticking with unleavened bread. Calvin and Pharaoh wanted to go with, with leavened bread. And uh, when they refused to serve communion, it caused kind of a riot and they were asked to leave town. So Calvin heads to the city of Strasbourg in southwestern Germany. This is a picture of Strasbourg Cathedral. Now Strasbourg, you may remember from a few lessons ago, this is where the reformer Martin Bootser, let's go ahead and show you him again. Martin Bootser was the lead reformer in the city of Strasbourg. And he had been working there for, for at this point, we're in 1538, he'd been there working there for about 15 years pursuing reformation. And he was, he was the, um, well known throughout Europe for his reforming efforts in this very important imperial city. And Bootser had, had a fair bit of success there in Strasbourg. He'd been able to work pretty closely with the city authorities and shape something of a common vision for how reform should proceed. Crucially, um, one of the things that, that Bootser was, was quite concerned about though, was the need for more serious church discipline. So this was, this was a problem in Protestant churches. And um, as you can see from, from Calvin's dedication to, to Francis, this idea that there were definitely people who were swarming into Protestant churches and, and embracing this gospel of justification by faith, 
and yet, and maybe, maybe with in many cases with good intentions, but not not living up to their profession of faith. And uh, and then there were some, perhaps with not good intentions, who were using uh, the Protestant gospel as a sort of excuse for continuing in sin. So what do you do with those people? How do you make sure that those who are professing the name of Christ are actually living up to it? Well, the medieval church had had um, a whole network of rules and regulations that could be enforced by church authorities in various, with various kinds of punishments, quite frequently with excommunication. Many of the reformers were hesitant about using excommunication because of the ways in which it had been abused by the medieval church. But it seemed like there had to be some kind of way of, um, of, of disciplining Christians who were not living up to their profession or even removing them from the church. And this was one of the particular concerns behind the Anabaptist movement. Remember that the reason the Anabaptists started baptizing adults was because, um, was because they were concerned about the way in which the Reformation was basically accepting the idea that everyone in society, everyone in society was baptized from the beginning, right? Uh, you, you, you're born, born into Zurich or whatever, you were going to be baptized. You were going to be a citizen of Zurich and you were going to be a member of the church in Zurich. And they said, well, that, that doesn't work because you're not necessarily uh, a member of the church in Zurich in any kind of meaningful sense because you may not be, have, any, have faith, you may not be living out your faith, the church needs to be different than the society. The church needs to be made up of true Christians only. So the Anabaptists practiced rebaptism, baptized those who were true professors of faith, and they practiced very strict church discipline to try and um, ensure the church, that their Anabaptist communities were only made up of those who were sort of truly committed. And Bootser uh, had a lot of, Interactions. There were a lot of Anabaptists in Strasbourg and areas around that. So Bootser had to engage with them and answer their accusations. And he realized that it was important to meet their accusations that the Protestant churches have some kind of meaningful church discipline, some kind of meaningful way of policing the boundaries of the church and keeping um, hypocrites, those who professed faith and weren't living up to it, keeping them from just being able to you know, continue on as if everything was fine. So this was something Bootser had really sought to pursue at Strasbourg with some limited success. And it was a lesson that Calvin really learned from him. And uh, well, it's, I guess I should say, historians are a little bit divided into to what extent Calvin took this from Bootser or may have already had ideas of his own. But in any case, when Calvin goes back to Geneva, as he will in a moment, we'll get to that, uh, he brings this vision of um, a sort of a strong structure of church discipline to make sure that the, not only is the preaching of the word of God reformed, but the behavior of Christian people is um, consistent with their new profession of faith. Now, um, while in Strasbourg, Calvin also has an important development in his personal life. He is married. Bootser was a great matchmaker, and Bootser uh, introduces him to this lady, Idolette de Boer, a, a widow, and convinces Calvin to marry. And she was a great support to Calvin in his future ministry, although sadly, none of their children lived past early childhood. Now, Calvin is in Strasbourg. Uh, he's been kicked out of Geneva. And, uh, but the Genevans, um, are, since the, because they've, they've kicked out Calvin, one of the leaders of the Catholic Church, Cardinal Jacopo Satoletto, says, oh, this is a good opportunity to try to persuade the Genevans of their errors and to bring them back to the Roman church. So he writes a letter to the people of Geneva saying, here's all the mistakes, the, the, the errors and confusions that you've been led into. You should return to the bosom of the Catholic church. The people of Geneva, or the city council of Geneva, is quite alarmed by this. Uh, they, you know, they, 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 they think he's wrong, but they're not quite sure how to answer him. And they actually had the gall to appeal to Calvin. They kicked Calvin out of the city, but they asked Calvin to help them out. They said, Calvin, can you please help write a response to Satoletto to sort of put our people at ease and refute his errors. So Calvin writes uh, the reply to Satoletto, which is one of the writings that Calvin is famous for. It's a, it's a, it's a very good, concise defense of Protestant teaching against, against common Catholic accusations, Roman Catholic accusations. <clears throat> 
and, and this is in the year 1540. So on the basis of this, the people, the leaders of the church of Geneva, the city council there says, you know, we really, things have just kind of gone from bad to worse since we kicked Calvin out. We need, really need to invite him back. And so they send messengers to Strasbourg begging Calvin to come back. And initially he says, rather would I submit to death a hundred times than to that cross on which I had to perish daily a thousand times over. He, he did not have pleasant memories of his time there in Geneva. But ultimately he feels as if he is indeed being called by God to minister in this important city. And in 1541, basically he says, to the leaders of Geneva, you can have me back, but uh, I'm only gonna come back if I can institute a system for a system for reformed church that I think is going to really last and is going to achieve the, go the goals of a, of a true Protestant reformation. And th in, in this uh, system that he puts in place, he tries to apply a lot of the principles about church discipline that Bootser was trying to put in practice in Strasbourg. So Calvin comes back to, to Geneva in 1541 and has a lot more authority than he had before. There's still going to be clashes with the city council throughout his time there. We'll hear a bit more about those in a later la lesson. But Calvin is given something of a free hand to begin instituting his vision for a comprehensively reformed church. And the success that he has there is able to make Geneva a model that many other churches seek to follow. So that, together with Calvin's great work in the Institutes of Christian Religion, quickly catapult Calvin to leadership among the, the, the Protestant leaders of Europe. And, and many people throughout Europe are, are looking to him and, uh, for inspiration. So uh, with that, we will wrap up this lesson. And our final lesson, or not our final lesson, our next lesson, let me just remember what it's going to be. Yes, oh, that's right, yes. So our next lesson, we are going to move south of the Alps to Italy. And most people don't associate Italy with the Reformation. But there was a, a real beginning of Protestant Reformation in Italy that was ultimately snuffed out and that led uh, key figures in that Reformation then uh, participated in the Reformation elsewhere in Europe. So join us next time at Davenant Academy to learn about the lost opportunity of the Italian Reformation. Thank you. Mm -hmm.